All right. So the first retro talk to kick it off today will be presented by Matti van Hoef, a postdoc researcher from KU Leuven. The subject of today is advanced Wi-Fi attacks using commodity hardware. Matti? Okay, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you Bricom for inviting me. Well, I should say thank you for the audience for voting for my talk. Um, so I'm going to talk about some research I did a few years ago about how we were able to use cheap Wi-Fi devices to carry out more advanced low-layer attacks. Uh, well, that's going to be part one of the talk. The second part of the talk will be about how these uh, low-layer attacks can help us carry out other attacks against Wi-Fi. And the big one here would be the crack attack against uh, WPA2. Uh, we will show that our attacks uh, help us to more easily execute that attack against the network. So in, in, in the introduction I mentioned that uh, we're going to talk about how the security has improved but I'm actually going to talk about how the attacks improved. So let's get started. Um, first I'm going to give some quick background on how Wi-Fi works and the first important assumption that normally is made in a Wi-Fi network is that each Wi-Fi device behaves fairly. Now what do I mean with fairly? With behaving fairly, I mean that every Wi-Fi device will also give other Wi-Fi devices a chance to transmit their frames. So in particular, let's say my laptop wants to send some data, it's first going to sense the air to see if someone else is already transmitting, and if that's the case, they're going to give that station enough time to finish their transmission, and essentially, if every uh, Wi-Fi client follows uh, this protocol, everyone will get a fair share of the total bandwidth of the network. Now, of course, if we are an attacker or some kind of malicious entity, we can get some special hardware and then we no longer have to follow any of these uh, rules that Wi-Fi specifies. And that, that's of course well known. If you make your own hardware, you can do what you want. Uh, so for example, we can do this selfish behavior and just always instantly transmit and so on. But apart from that, we can also do some other interesting stuff. For example, we can decide to continuously jam certain Wi-Fi frequencies so, uh, the fre so certain Wi-Fi frequency bands will become completely unusable and you can no longer uh, use your Wi-Fi. And I would say the more interesting attack here is that you can also selectively jam certain clients only. And that's a very advanced attack because the way it works is it will decode the header of a Wi-Fi packet while that packet is still being transmitted. Then it will uh, decide based on the MAC addresses in the header whether to jam the remaining content and then it will trans uh, transmit some kind of noise to jam the last bytes of the packet. And as you can imagine, you need really good hardware to do this. I mean, you need to be fast enough to decode the header, you need to be fast enough to then initialize the jammer to jam the last, last packets uh, of, the pipe, uh, of the packet, and all that has to be done within a few, uh, say, 500 microseconds, because that's the time it takes to send an ordinary Wi-Fi frame. But people showed that with advanced equipment, for example, these USRPs here, which costs, uh, say, $3,000 or $4,000, it's possible. However, you can see that this still has a bit of a price tag, so people didn't consider it to be that serious of a threat. Unfortunately, our contribution here is that it turns out you don't need this fancy equipment to carry out these attacks. What we did instead is we got these uh, rather cheap USB uh, devices and it turns out that using them we can implement this selfish behavior where we can let a Wi-Fi client transmit instantly. Uh, we can even implement the continuous jammer and the most surprising result here, we can also implement this selective jammer which is able to jam only specific Wi-Fi packets. And I'm going to discuss how we did this in the first part of the talk, and in the second part, I'm going to discuss how these enable us to reliably manipulate encrypted traffic in a Wi-Fi network, and then carry out attacks against, say, WPA-TKIP or WPA-2. 
So I would say that the takeaway message here is that uh, we don't need expensive devices. We can just use a cheap uh, Wi-Fi dongle of, say, 10 or $20. And that means that as a defender, we should be able to detect these attacks. Take, for example, a very common situation where you have some kind of security webcam uh, that is using Wi-Fi or the frequency, the same frequency as Wi-Fi, then the user should be alerted if uh, the connection is somehow broken. Because it could be that the device maybe is just malfunctioning or that the battery ran out. But it could also be that an attacker is trying to jam your security cam and the user at least needs to be warned of that. So that covers most of the background. The first thing that we're going to discuss now is how can we implement this selfish behavior using our cheap Wi-Fi devices. And the idea here is we're not going to test this analytically, we're just going to implement this, run the experiment, and then see what works and doesn't work. Now before we get to that, there's one more thing that I need to explain, and that's how the Wi-Fi protocol actually works when you decide to transmit a frame. So, Let's take the following example. We want to transmit a Wi-Fi frame and our device notices that someone else is already transmitting. Well, what happens in that case is we of course wait until that other device has finished transmitting and then we wait a very small amount of, of time called the SIFS interval and the idea behind that interval is that this is the time it takes for all receivers to properly uh, capture the Wi-Fi signal, to demodulate it, to convert it to actual bytes, and to then decide whether that packet is destined for them or not. And this time, for example, also includes uh, the time needed for the receiver to copy it to memory, and so on. Now, we're not going to transmit our own device just yet. We're also going to wait an additional time called the uh, AIFSN interval. And the idea here is that this time that we wait now depends on the priority of the frame. For example, if we notice that this packet was actually destined for us, we're now immediately going to send an acknowledgement without waiting any longer. However, if we're sending some other data, for example, if we're uh, talking on the phone and we're sending voice data, then this period is rather small. Whereas if we're just browsing the internet and we're sending some background IP data, uh, this period is a bit longer. And the idea here is if you have high priority data, for example, a voice call, uh, you will transmit faster than you have low, if you have low priority data. Now there is one more uh, time interval that we will wait, and that is called the backoff interval. And the idea here is that every station uh, waits a random amount of time, and that's to avoid collision. Because let's say that two people are waiting to transmit after that packet, um, the idea is that most of the cases they would both select a random backoff interval, meaning they would also transmit uh, at different times, and these packets would not uh, collide. So. If we have now waited for the duration of all these periods combined and we saw no one else transmitting before us, only then will a client send its own packet. And it has proven very well to work in practice. I mean, we're all using Wi-Fi today and yes, yeah, sometimes we have a bad network, but most of the time this works very well. So our idea is now to take our uh, cheap Wi-Fi devices and we want to manipulate this process and no longer play by these rules. You might think this is tricky to do because maybe it's implemented in hardware, maybe we cannot change it, uh, but we found out that if we take the firmware that is running on these Wi-Fi devices, and interestingly this firmware is uh, open source, we can quite easily modify some of these uh, parameters. For example, if we want to disable the back-off time, uh, that's something we can do, and I will discuss in a bit how. We can also change um, these two intervals as well. So we can essentially make our device transmit instantly after the other device is done transmitting. So we did some experiments uh, where we implemented this and then tested how much of an advantage an attacker can gain by doing this. And here what we found out that the optimal strategy for the attacker to really uh, increase its bandwidth, its throughput as much as possible is to 
disable back off and set the AI FSN uh, period to zero. That gives the best strategy. And in the lab setup, what we noticed is that we are able to improve the throughput from uh, 14 megabits per second to 37 megabits per second, which I would say is a very significant improvement. Now, one maybe surprising result is that if we would also reduce the SIFS interval, then we would actually get a lower throughput. Now, maybe you think that's weird because if we reduce this period, we're sending packets faster. So how can it be that we then get a lower throughput? Well, the explanation is actually quite simple. Remember that this SIFS uh, period is used to give the receiver enough time to, you know, demodulate the frame, copy it to memory, and so on. And if we don't give the receiver enough time anymore, then it won't always be ready to receive the next packet until we'll get packet loss because of that. Now, another important remark here is that we can only increase the throughput uh, from the client, so from the attacker, towards the access point. So we can only increase the throughput in the uplink direction, not in the downlink from the access point to the client, because we assume we do not control the access point, so we can also not change the behavior of the access point. So we can only influence the uplink, uh, the upload. So, I explained in high level how we are able to accomplish this, but how do you do, actually do this you know, at a code level? So I mentioned we had to change the firmware of these devices, but you may be wondering, is this complicated to do or not? Well, it turns out, once you know how to do it, it's actually really simple, because you can simply uh, use memory mapped registers to set certain bits and enable or disable features. For example, to disable this back-off period, we simply uh, find the memory register that is used for this, this. We set a certain bit in this memory register, and that's it. The same is true for resetting the, uh, these two time periods as well. We simply need to look through the documentation. That does take a while to find the correct uh, memory register, but then it's very easy. We simply set this register to zero, which then implies that these uh, intervals are now set to zero as well. So that's really straightforward in my opinion, and uh, I was a bit surprised by this, but on the other hand, it's very nice because that means we have a lot of control over our own device. So there's one final thing here I want to come back to. I mentioned that you have to modify the firmware of these devices, and you may be wondering, why don't we just modify the driver of uh, these Wi-Fi devices? I mean, they're supposed to control the Wi-Fi chip as well, no? Well, the reason that we have to modify uh, the firmware is because if we look at the Wi-Fi dongle, we see that it actually consists of two separate chips. We first have our radio chip here on the right, which takes the physical Wi-Fi signal, decodes it, uh, and then stores it in memory. But we also have a second chip in these devices, and this second chip is used to communicate over USB with your main uh, computer, in a sense. And in order to set these memory mapped registers, we need to run our code on the CPU of the Wi-Fi dongle itself, meaning we cannot do this at the driver level. At the driver level. We really need to do this at the firmware uh, itself. So, that covers the aspect of the attacker. Um, the good news is that there uh, was a research prototype a few years ago of a defense mechanism against this, and they're able to detect if a certain client in your Wi-Fi network is behaving in this unfair manner. So you can use this to monitor your own man uh, network, and if then this selfish client is detected, you can decide to kick it off the network. Now, an explanation I did now, I assumed that there would only be one selfish station and that all the others are behaving fairly. But what happens if there are two selfish stations and they both uh, follow this, uh, the, the same strategy where they just transmit as fast as possible? Well, you might imagine that in that case, you know, they'll transmit at the same time, so there will be a collision and both frames are lost. 
At least that's what I've always been told uh, during my studies that if you have two transmissions at the same time, yeah, you'll lose both of them. Turns out that in practice that's not always the case. In practice, it's generally the packet that has the best signal quality and uses the lowest bit rate that is still received correctly and in a sense the other packet is just seen as background noise. And this is called the capture effect and I'm going to give a quick demonstration about this capture effect using an FM radio and in this demo there will be a guy uh, walking uh, around and let me get this ready and here you will see that there are multiple radio stations uh, in, in the vicinity and depending on where he is walking one of these radio sa stations will have a better signal and that's the radio station uh, you will hear let's see if I can Mm -mm. For some reason, I cannot play it through HDMI. HDMI. Uh, let's show this on the screen as well. My laptop should be loud enough. So we hear the first radio station now. But if the person then walks around, depending on where he walks, another radio station will have a better signal. And you can hear the, 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 the receiver sometimes decodes radio channel one, sometimes radio channel two, depending on the quality of the signal. So I think this is a very nice demonstration that um, depending on the quality, one of these devices, one of these uh, transmitters will in a sense win the collision and that's the one uh, that the receiver will indeed receive properly. So let's go back to the presentation. And the same idea applies to uh, Wi-Fi as well. And the attacker can abuse this. What the attacker can do is it will, if there are two selfish, selfish stations that are competing, one selfish station will lower its own bit rate uh, to increase this, the quality of its own signal, basically. And this results in a cat and mouse game where the first selfish station will lower its bit rate, meaning that the frame its sense will now get uh, decoded properly, but in turn the other selfish station will also start lowering its bit rate to increase uh, the quality of, of its uh, signal. Then the other will uh, do the same and they will keep lowering their bit rate until this no longer gives any advantage. And this means we get in a funny situation where these selfish stations are now trying to increase their throughput as much as possible and they do that by lowering their bit rate. You may think that's surprising, but if you look at it from a different way, this actually makes a lot of sense because one selfish station is simply treating the other selfish station as background noise. And what do you do if there's a lot of background noise? Well, you lower your bit rate so your frames still get uh, received properly. So that covers the selfish uh, behavior part. Um, we're now going to discuss uh, I th what I think are the more cool results. Uh, and the first one here is how to implement this continuous jammer, which basically blocks uh, Wi-Fi for everyone in your vicinity. So we want to be able to implement this again using our very cheap Wi-Fi devices. So what do we need to do in order to accomplish that? Well, the first step is we want to be able to instantly transmit a packet even if someone else is already transmitting, our device just needs to ch start jamming uh, the channel. And in order to do that, we need to disable this thing called uh, carrier sense. And 
carrier sense is essentially the mechanism that Wi-Fi devices use to see if someone else is already transmitting or not. And we just want to disable that. We just want to transmit all the time independent of what's going on. On top of that, we also want to then send the signal without any interruptions at all. And the way we'll, we will do this is we will make the Wi-Fi device transmit a lot of dummy Wi-Fi packets. But we want to do this without ever uh, being interrupted. So in a sense, we want to queue an infinite amount of packets to be sure our device is always transmitting. But of course, you know, in reality, you have a limited amount of memory. Especially in these uh, Wi-Fi devices, you, are, uh, you have to operate under very low memory constraints. So how can we queue a high amount of packets to be sure that uh, our jammer is always operating? Well, to answer that question, we're going to uh, look at how uh, frames are queued for transmissions on these devices. And they use the following approach. We have our uh, Wi-Fi uh, chip here. And essentially, it's giving a linked list of frames that it should transmit uh, in the future. And how do we then manipulate this into sending an infinite amount of packets? Well, it's actually really simple. Uh, maybe some of you already have a clue how to do it. We simply turn this linked list into a circular list, and there you go. We are now sending an infinite amount of packets without any interruption at all, while using a very low amount of memory. So we did some experiments uh, using this. And the first interesting observation is that, in principle, our jammer is sending valid Wi-Fi packets, even though they contain a dummy uh, content. But it turns out that because our Wi-Fi packets are sent so fast after one another, if you put another Wi-Fi device in monitor mode, that device will not be able to decode these frames. So you really don't see any, anything being transmitted at all. The other interesting remark is that this continuous jammer isn't just uh, trying to uh, cause collisions with other stations or trying to you know, mangle other packets that are being transmitted. It's actually silencing other devices. Now, what do I mean with this? Well, the other Wi-Fi devices, they are still operating in a fair manner. And the first thing they do when they want to transmit a frame is they're going to see is someone else already transmitting. And if that's the case, they wait for that transmission to be complete. So to put it in a different ways, essentially other devices are thinking like, oh, there's this constant jammer. Let's not transmit. And this makes our jammer very, effectively, very effective in practice. Because if we use, for example, this Wi-Fi device, we can uh, silence other Wi-Fi devices for up to a range of 80 meters, uh, assuming there are no walls in between. So this is with a clear uh, line of sight. And if we use a rather cheap amplifier, we can even extend this to 120 uh, meters. So let me give, again, a quick video demo demonstration uh, of this. Where is my mouse? So here I'm going to first uh, initialize uh, the devices that, the Wi-Fi devices that I'm going to use. And I have two Wi-Fi devices, and the first one I'm now going to put into monitor, monitor mode, and I'm going to capture all the packets uh, that I am receiving. So we can see here that uh, this was uh, recorded at uh, my hotel last year at uh, Brucon. Uh, well, actually, a few years ago, and we're receiving everything properly now. But once we start our constant jammer, we can see that uh, the traffic now has come to a halt, and we're indeed not receiving anything at all. And even though, in principle, our jammer is sending valid Wi-Fi packets, you can see that while the jammer was active, it wasn't receiving a thing. Now we disable the jammer and we are again receiving packets. So here you can see these 10 minutes the constant jammer was active and no packets were received at all. And here the 888, that's the dummy packet uh, we are transmitting. So last year during Brucon I actually did a live demo of this. Uh, unfortunately today I want to uh, make sure I still have some time so I can also explain how our work influences the crack attack. Uh, I'm taking a demo. Now would uh, be too much time. 
So if you want to try this out at home uh, yourself, this is uh, also supported on a Raspberry Pi. So what you can do is you can buy a Raspberry Pi, you can plug in these USB devices, maybe you can attach a battery pack to your Raspberry Pi, and then you can just put a device near your neighbors that you don't like or maybe something else. I don't recommend doing that, but in principle it's possible. Um, but on a more serious note, what's the impact of this in practice? Well, we know we can jam other Wi-Fi devices, but it goes beyond that. We can jam any device that uses the same frequencies as Wi-Fi. So we can also jam, for example, the Bluetooth and uh, Zigbee protocol. And these are systems that are used in uh, home automation devices. Uh, I think sometimes even some contr industrial control systems use them. Uh, you have the Internet of Things that uses these frequency as well. And we can jam all these uh, devices. So maybe one example close to home is uh, these days you have these very fancy baby monitors that provide a live video and audio feed. And some of these devices use the same frequency as Wi-Fi, meaning we can jam them as well. Now, this is still a fairly innocent example, but there are also some, in this case, security cameras which use the same frequency uh, as Wi-Fi, and that means they again can also be jammed. So here it's very important if you run a, um, some camera over these frequencies that you are able to detect when you lost your connection. Because then you know, well, either the battery ran out or there's an attack going on. Now, I also think, though I'm not 100% sure of this, that some uh, cars, uh, when you want to unlock them using your uh, key fob, they also use the same frequency uh, as Wi-Fi. Even though most cars use another frequency, I think there's a chance that uh, some of them also use these frequencies in Wi-Fi. And that's a very interesting scenario as well, because what an attacker can do is the attacker can jam the lock signal that you send to your car. So you can imagine the situation, you just park your car, you're walking away, you just press the button without looking whether your car is actually locking, but you as an attacker just locked that, uh, you, you just jammed that lock signal, meaning the car is still open. And you can then uh, enter the car and do what you want. And this is not just wild speculation. We see that in practice, uh, people are actually performing these jamming attacks if the jamming device is cheap enough and there's a big enough advantage to do this. For example, there are relatively cheap uh, jammers that indeed exist uh, for these key fobs for your car that are able to uh, carry out this attack where you can block the lock signal uh, of a car. Now, it can go beyond this. Uh, sometimes uh, these cars also have an anti-theft system. For example, a GPS that uh, tracks their location. And here we also see that in practice, sometimes thieves are trying to then jam these GPS signals or the data communication uh, in order to defeat these anti-theft systems. And the last example, I think, is, is the most extreme one. Um, I think th these were some robbers that were trying to uh, rob some store or a home. And they really prepared quite uh, well because before they uh, went inside, they cut the cables of the telephone line. Uh, they also cut the cables of their uh, security system, their security cameras. And on top of that, they also had a device that would jam mobile communications such as your phone. So. They really took a quite extreme step here, but it does show that sometimes uh, attackers really will use these jammers in practice as well. So now we get to uh, the second part where we will implement a selective uh, jammer. Now we're not going to present that fast. So what a selector j j jammer does is it will decode the header of a Wi-Fi frame while this Wi-Fi frame is still being transmitted. And then based on the MAC addresses that occur in the header, it will decide uh, whether it will jam the remaining content uh, or not. So to explain this in a bit more detail, if we want to implement this ourselves, 
what we need to be able to do is that we first need to be able to detect that there is a Wi-Fi transmission going on. Now, thankfully, Wi-Fi devices do this uh, already. But then we need to be able to decode this header uh, and then access this decoded uh, information while the last part of the Wi-Fi frame is still being transmitted on the still in the air. Then once we decide it, once we have access to this data, we need to decide will we jam it or not. We need to disable the reception of this frame and then uh, switch our antenna from receive mode to transmit mode. And then finally the third step is to inject a dummy packet so we can jam the remaining content of this Wi-Fi frame. And even though technically we're only jamming the last few bytes uh, of this packet, this will cause the complete packet to, de -drop, to be dropped. And why is that the case? Well, every Wi-Fi packet contains a CRC, it contains a checksum, and by jamming the last bytes of the Wi-Fi packet, this checksum will become invalid, and because of that, uh, the receiver will drop this packet uh, without looking at the content at all. So, how are we able to pull this off using our own cheap uh, Wi-Fi devices? Well, it turns out that step two and three is actually quite easy to do. The hard part is decoding and uh, processing the first few bytes of this Wi-Fi packet while the transmission has not yet been fully completed. And in order to pull this off, we relied on one important observation. And that observation is that if you look at our Wi-Fi dongle, as I mentioned previously, it consists of two chips. The first one is the radio chip, which will uh, receive the physical Wi-Fi signal. It will decode it and then uh, write it to memory. But there's also the second chip, uh, which is the CPU that communicates through USB with the main computer. Now, interestingly, when the radio chip is receiving a frame, it will use direct memory access to write it to memory. Meaning, while the radio chip is transmitting, we can run any code on the CPU that we want. And in particular, what we can do, we can just monitor this memory using uh, the internal CPU and see whenever the radio chip is writing uh, decoded bytes to the memory. So the idea here is that we first write some initialization value, values uh, to this memory, and once we notice that this memory is being changed, we know that the radio chip is in the process of receiving a frame. So I want to explain this in a bit more detail. So as I mentioned, the first step is uh, decoding uh, this header while the packet is still in the air. And as I explained, we are going to Paul, uh, we're going to read the memory until we notice that this memory is being changed. So how does this look like at the code level? Well, we have the following while loop that is essentially detecting if we are receiving a packet or not. Now the first part of this while loop is just to protect against an, uh, in, in, an infinite loop. Um, the second condition here is the important one because if this memory byte changes, that means that our radio chip is now writing the first few bytes of the packet to memory. Then the second step is once we know that a, a MAC header is being, has been written to the memory, we can now simply inspect the content of this header. For example, we can see if, if it was a beacon or a probe request, uh, and we can also inspect uh, the MAC addresses that are contained in this uh, header, and we can decide to jam the remaining content or not. Then the second step we need to do is we need to abort the reception of this frame. And this is surprisingly simple. We simply have to find uh, the correct memory register and set the receive abort. So Rx stands here for receive. And we simply set this bit and then we abort the current reception. So that's very trivial. Then the last step is we need to inject this dummy packet uh, into the air. And Again, that's quite straightforward. I mean, yeah, you need to read the documentation well to find out uh, these memory uh, registers, but to inject the packet is quite straightforward. You simply uh, first give the radio chip a pointer to the, to the packet you want to transmit, and then you simply uh, set a bit in the TXE register, which stands for transmit enable, 
which, as the name implies, will cause your packet uh, to be transmitted. On that's it. So we did some experiments uh, you, with this attack uh, in practice. So we jammed some uh, beacons under several uh, locations and positions. And our goal was to be able to see how reliable is a selective jammer that uh, works like this. And to determine how reliable it is, we essentially want to know how fast it can react to a packet. Because if it can react very fast, we can even uh, selectively jam short packets. But if it's too slow, then maybe we're not able to jam packets at all. So what we did is we first uh, jammed beacon frames in the 2.4 gigahertz band where they, are, where they are sent at one uh, megabit per second. And then we were able to uh, mangle uh, and uh, basically mess with bytes that start at position uh, 52 of the beacon. When we are jamming uh, in the 5 gigahertz band, uh, these beacons are sent uh, faster. Uh, and in this case, we start jamming bytes at position 88. And in general, uh, that's enough to jam medium uh, to uh, small packets. Unfortunately, we cannot jam very small packets using this. The second remark I also want to make is that this selective jammer will never be 100% reliable. And the first reason that it's not 100% reliable is that sometimes it just won't even notice that a beacon is being transmitted. So sometimes there's background noise and it simply doesn't detect the beacon at all, so it, also, it won't even attempt to jam it. And in my opinion, this is quite surprising that this is possible using just a very limited uh, API that we are able to pull off all these uh, attacks. So I again have a quick demonstration video uh, for this one as well. So as I mentioned, uh, three years ago uh, I did a live demo of this which fortunately worked. Uh, but redoing it here would uh, take a bit too much time to plug in all the devices uh, and has the risk of then the demo failing. Uh, don't want to risk it this time. So here we're again setting up uh, one Wi-Fi device in monitor mode and you will see that it is uh, properly receiving beacons of the test network. And we now also have a second Wi-Fi device which is our cheap Wi-Fi device which we will set in uh, which will do the selective jamming. So you can see the command uh, here. We execute that command uh, and then you will see in Wireshark we are indeed no longer resending, receiving any beacon frames. And the reason we're not resending beacon frames is because Linux is dropping packets that have a wrong CRC. If we now instruct Linux to also show us packets that have a bad CRC using this command, we can see that, yeah, we're, we are actually receiving beacons, but because they are selectively jammed, they have a bad CRC, and that's why Linux will immediately drop these packets and not process them further. So you can see here, uh, these packets indeed have an incorrect CRC. So let's stop the demo here. So if you want to try out this for yourself, um, you can simply go to the following URL and we have uh, the code public there. It's very easy to run this. You uh, simply need to download this uh, virtual machine image. You need to buy one of these devices and from that point is just plug and play. Um, I do want to point out that our continuous jammer is not released publicly because this really disrupts uh, networks without there being a very good countermeasure. Uh, but if you are a researcher or if you are testing the implications of uh, a continuous jammer, you can always contact us and we can give you uh, the code. So compared to three years ago, there's also a very interesting and exciting uh, update and that update comes from uh, fellow researchers and they were able to implement similar jamming techniques but in this case using your mobile phone. So what they did is they took a Nexus 5, they used uh, what is called uh, the Nexmon project which is a project that also enables for example monitor mode uh, on your uh, mobile phone and they are able to change the firmware of the Wi-Fi chip that is running on your phone. 
and they are able to implement the same techniques, meaning you can also do this constant and reactive jamming purely uh, using your mobile phone. So that's quite neat to do uh, as well. And their code is public as well. So if you want to play around with it, um, it's very fun to do. Of course, in a lab setting. So that covers the uh, physical layer aspects of our attack. Um, the interesting thing here is that our the text that we discussed now, they can actually be used to uh, facilitate, to make it easier to then perform attacks against uh, the higher la layers of the Wi-Fi protocol as well. So. Three years ago, I discussed how I uh, used these attacks to then carry out attack against WPA TKIP. Um, however, in the meantime, I found uh, a little bit of a better attack. We can also use this to break WPA2, or at least to facilitate attacks against WPA2. And why is that the case? Well, the key reinstallation attack, so the crack attack against WPA2, in order to perform this uh, attack, the adversary needs to be able to block and delay certain messages that are exchanged in the handshake. And well, blocking certain packets, that's exactly what our selective jammer is capable of doing. Now, I did mention that you know this selective jammer is not 100% reliable, so there's an even better approach here, and that's that we can get a man in the middle position, a so-called channel-based man in the middle position, and again, our uh, physical layer attacks here can help us to obtain this uh, channel-based man in the middle position. So I'm now going to discuss this in a bit more detail about how this attack works against WPA2. So first, I need to give a very quick background here. So. Let's say that we have a WPA2 uh, network. It can be just your home network or an enterprise network where you need to log in using a username and a password. In both cases, this protected Wi-Fi network will use uh, what is called the four-way handshake to securely connect to this network. And what does the four-way handshake do? Well, it provides two important properties. The first is that it will provide mutual authentication. So you as a client are verifying that you are really connecting to the access point that you want to. And the access point is ver also verifying that you, uh, the client, possesses the correct credentials to connect to the network. Now at the same time, this four-way handshake also negotiates uh, a fresh session key, which uh, is called the PTK. And this uh, session key will be used to encrypt uh, data frames after the four-way handshake has completed. So I will now explain how this uh, handshake works and how we are able uh, to attack it. So let's say we have the following situation. We have our client here on the left that wants to connect to the network on the right. And we also assume that uh, an adversary is present as well. And the first thing that this adversary will do is it will establish this so-called channel-based man in the middle position. Now, what do I mean with that term? What I mean with that is that, let's say the original network is operating on channel six, then the adversary will clone uh, this network on a different channel. It will clone the network on channel one. And the adversary is essentially using two uh, Wi-Fi devices to do this. One Wi-Fi device is operating on channel six. It receives all the frames from the access point, and then they are forwarded using uh, the second Wi-Fi device on this different channel. But now the question is, how can we force the victim into using channel one? So maybe you already have an idea on how to force the victim on this channel. Um, because our solution is actually quite simple. We can simply use our continuous jammer to jam channel one, and as a result, the victim will only see the access point that is present on channel one. And that will cause the victim to try to connect to this access point on channel one. And once we notice that the victim is connecting on channel one, then we will stop our continuous jammer and simply forward all frames uh, over channel six towards the access point. 
so let's say in particular now that uh, our client will indeed try to uh, authenticate to the network. And if you're connecting to an enterprise network, uh, for example, if you have to log in using a password uh, on the username, for example, in the network such as Ethereum, or you have to log in sorry, using uh, certificates, then there's first this uh, 802.1x authentication handshake. Fortunately, the details of this handshake are not important for us. Uh, the only thing that's important for us is that at this point, after executing this handshake, there is some shared secret between the client on the access point. Or in case you have a home network, then uh, this shared secret between both devices is simply the password uh, of the network. And once we have the shared secret, we can execute the four-way handshake. And as the name of this handshake implies, the four-way handshake consists of four messages. And the first two messages are used to exchange uh, a random number between both devices. So here we can see the access point is first sending uh, a random number called the A nonce, which stands for access point nonce. It sends it to the client, and in turn the client replies using its own random number called the S nonce, and that stands for supplicant nonce, where supplicant is just a synonym for client. And once both devices uh, have received each other's random number, uh, they can combine these two random numbers called the A nonce and the S nonce together with the shared secret uh, to derive this fresh session key called the PTK. And remember, this PTK, the session key, will be used to encrypt data frames uh, after this handshake has been uh, completed. So after this, there are two more frames that are exchanged in this handshake. And a bit simplified, these frames just confirm that both parties negotiated the same session key. Now, what we do as an attacker here in order to uh, attack WPA2 is we're not going to forward this last message to the access point. So we're not going to forward it, what essentially means we're blocking this frame from arriving at the access point. And now we get in a very interesting situation because the client believes that the four-way handshake has now completed because it received all the frames of the handshake and it also replied using all the frames it has to as well. In particular, it replied using message four, so it thinks that the handshake now has successfully completed, meaning it will now install the session key for use, meaning after this, it, can, uh, it will start sending encrypted data frames. And an important observation here is that when it installs the session key, it sets the special variable called the nonce to zero. Now I will come back to what this nonce is in a bit. This nonce is essentially just a packet number that is incremented by one for, for every packet that you are transmit. So the first data packet you want to transmit will use a nonce value of, of one, the second a nonce value of two, and so on. So it's basically just an incremental uh, counter. But I want to come back here to the special situation where the access point hasn't received message four yet. Because according to the access point, the handshake hasn't completed yet. And in particular, the access point will think, okay, well, maybe message three got lost here, and that's why I didn't get a reply. So the access point will try to recover from that, and what it will do is it will retransmit message three. And in response, the client will accept this retransmitted message, and it will reply using a new message four. Now, the Wi-Fi standard says that this message for should normally be, be sent unencrypted, and in plain text, uh, but we saw that many implementations sent this frame in an encrypted fashion, uh, and the reason why is because you know, the session key has already been installed. Uh, now, understanding uh, why this message is encrypted is not that important, just accept for now that this message is indeed encrypted. What's more important here is that after sending this new reply to the access point, the client will again install the session key, meaning it will again reset this nonce to zero. And that is what will allow us to uh, decrypt data. So in order to understand how this nonce 
that is now being again reset to zero enable us, us to decrypt data. I need to quickly explain you know, how encryption actually is performed in a Wi-Fi network. So let me uh, quickly explain that. So let's say we want to send uh, the plain text data here. And no matter what your specific settings of your Wi-Fi network are, you know, whether you're using the old WPA TKIP, whether you're using uh, WPA2 with AES, they all work at, at a high level at the same way. And what happens is that they take this uh, session key, this secret session key, and they combine it with the nonce, with this packet number, and they use this to derive a unique per packet key. So as I mentioned, this packet number is always incremented by one for every packet that is transmitted. And uh, by combining it with the session key, we always have a unique per packet key. And this unique per packet key is then used to derive some uh, fresh key stream uh, uh, from the packet key. Uh, then encryption is quite straightforward. We simply take the key stream, we sort it with the plain text data, and there you go, we get the encrypted uh, version of the packet. Now, of course, a plain text header is added, added as well, so the receiver uh, knows what to do with this packet. Um, but the important observation and the important assumption of this encryption model is that a specific nonce value should never be repeating. Now, why is that the case? Well, if a nonce value ever repeats, it means that we will generate the same per packet key to encrypt two or more packets. And if we use the same per packet key, we will also use the same key stream. And that means we have key stream reuse. And an attacker in general can always exploit key stream reuse. So for example, let's say the first time that a certain key stream is used, we can predict the data that the client is sending then what we can do is we can simply take the encrypted data that we as an attacker captured, we can sort that with the plain text data, and the result will be the key stream. So to put it in a different way, if we can predict certain frames that are sent over the Wi-Fi network, we can derive key stream, the key stream that was used to encrypt that packet. And if then that key stream is ever reused, well, we know the key stream, and then we can use it to decrypt uh, another packet. So, Let's go back to our attack here. Um, so to quickly recap, this was the message three that was retransmitted by the access point. Uh, it caused an encrypted reply of message four. The victim then reinstalled the session key and it reset this counter to zero, meaning here this data packet again uses the same nonce value of one. So both these frames use the same nonce value, meaning they use the same key stream. So the question now is, okay, how can we decrypt this data packet? We assume that we don't know the content of this data packet. Now, if you look carefully at this diagram, there's enough information here to be able to carry out uh, this attack. In particular, as I mentioned, these use, we have nonce reuse. But what we see now is that we have a plain text version of the packet here, and we have the retransmitted version of the packet here as well. There is a minor difference between these frames, but generally most of the content is the same. So if we sort these two frames, we get the key stream corresponding to this nonce value of one, and we can then use this key stream to sort this data packet, and there you go, we can de decrypt this packet, meaning we now have effectively broken WPA2. So, that uh, actually already concludes my talk. Uh, so. The takeaway messages here are uh, that jamming is cheaper than expected. We don't need this expensive equipment of up to uh, $4,000. Uh, Sometimes a cheap uh, $20 or $10 device is enough. And in my opinion, the most interesting finding here is that we're e even, even able to implement this selective jammer using our cheap uh, devices. And Recently, there's been new research going on, as I mentioned, that we can carry out these attacks not only using USB Wi-Fi devices, but we can also use our smartphone in order to carry off, uh, in order to pull off these attacks. And finally, in our uh, crack attack against WPA2, we actually relied on some of these uh, 
low layer attacks in order to reliably manipulate encrypted data frames to then uh, attack the encryption algorithm uh, that we used. So here is again the link to our uh, code. And if you have any questions, feel free uh, to ask them. So thank you. So any questions? You said there are minor differences between the first plain text packet and the encrypted uh, mm -hmm. packet. How do you get around those minor differences? I assume the decrypted packet isn't entirely decrypted then. Yeah, so if you would use the technique exactly as I, as I explained here, then this minor difference would indeed uh, mean that you would not be able to decrypt the full content uh, of this data frame that we want to decrypt. Um, but what you can do as an attacker is you can uh, you can delay this key reinstallation and you can wait until the victim, for example, sends some ARP request or DHCP request where you can predict all the content. And then you can use uh, these frames where you are able to predict all the content to carry out a very similar attack. Okay, thank you. Looks like there are no more questions, so again, thank you for the attention. <laughs>